Hello and welcome to the 33rd episode of The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. On today's show, we have an author who's brand new on the scene with a book Peter Ferris calls a rollicking Old Testament ass whooping. <laughs> Mark Westmoreland shares a good many things as well as bringing out the Southern boy in me. Hey, it's hard to talk to someone from Georgia and not bring out the North Carolina accent. Heck, let's just shut up and get to it right here on The Thriller Zone. I can hear you now. But can you see my beautiful face? I see it. It sounds like we have a slight delay, so just don't let that freak you. Um, I'll try not to jump on top of you or so forth. Sounds good. I'll do the same. Hey, lean to the side. Let me see that beautiful book behind you. Mm. Isn't it a great cover? It is a a great cover. It's a cover like... uh, like big time it's a big time cover yeah it kind of makes me think of those uh like smoke in the bandit style movie posters from back in the 70s you know like gator and all that dude you're just obsessed with burt reynolds for god's dude, sakes I love burt. <laughs> uh burt we're still in the green room so we haven't officially started <laughs> qu- quoting but uh burt reynolds was one of those guys you couldn't help but love that guy. Every single thing he right. did, right? Yeah, he just like had charm and screen presence, and he was like one of the boys. Yeah, that little grin of his, especially in yep. the. I think of all the bandits. You know, I just think that little grin he'd always and that little. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'm in the process of revising a book now called Midnight Runner, and mm. it's basically. Uh, it's uh, Smokey and the Bandit meets No Country for Old Men. And it's like my love letter to Burt Reynolds and like my best attempt to write a book that he would read and want to star in and make into a movie, you know? Oh, dude, I would so read that. Yeah, well, I'm going to I'm gonna try the, the query process with agents to see if it gets... Uh, any attention and if not i'm gonna give it to shotgun honey because uh ron knocked it out of the park with a violent gospel and i want to see what kind of cover he would come up with for uh midnight runner midnight runner i heard a rumor while while we are still on bert uh i had a rumor that uh sally field really truly was his love of his life wasn't she Have you ever read his memoir, But Enough Uh About Me? Okay, so I recommend getting the audio book. That book came out like two or three years before he passed away. So he he reads the audio book, and he's got uh, one whole chapter that's just about Sally Field. And they, uh, one thing I really like that the producers of the audio book did is they didn't edit anything out as he's reading and stuff. So at the end of the uh, chapter about Sally Field, and I don't want to spoil nothing, but he actually gets emotional and starts crying. And he ends that chapter by by saying his biggest regret in life was never telling her that he was in love with her. Are you shitting me? No, not at all. And the chapter ends with him basically weeping on the audio after that. I was just like, Damn, son. Like, I got emotional listening to you. Yeah. I'm such a crybaby at stuff like that. Same. And you know what? If I'm not mistaken, Sally has, last thing I read about her, she wanted to say Vafangu to Hollywood and was going to move to somewhere and just be reclusive and say, see y'all. And um, I don't know if she's married or not. I don't either. Uh, I also read her memoir in pieces and uh, it was kind of a disappointment because she came off really bitter and angry towards like Hollywood and different people like that, which it sounds like from the way she told it, she had some bad experiences. So I totally get that. But yeah, uh, she didn't have a lot of good, as much good to say about Burt Reynolds as he did about her. So, you know, whoops. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Well, hi, I'm Mark Westmoreland, and welcome to the Thriller Zone. Let's officially get started. All right. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. We're going to get to, as we mentioned earlier, the a vicious gospel, which is there behind you in just a second. But uh, I want to first talk about you. Now, 
with that heavy New York accent of yours, what part of Bronx or is it Queens you're from? I'm from Harlem, actually. <laughs> Perfect. Well, well done. Now, are you you were born and bred in Georgia, correct? Yes, sir. So my hometown uh, is about an hour and a half northeast of Atlanta. Oh. Uh, it's Stevens County, the city's Tacoa. Uh, if you've ever seen or read Band of Brothers, that yes. first episode called Curhee, the mountain that they run up and down, uh, that's my hometown. So, and there's a there's a museum there for Easy Easy Company, and they've got the road paved. So, if you you're brave enough, you can run the three miles up and three miles down the mountain. But you're now in Oklahoma, right? Yes, sir. I moved out to Oklahoma in 2006. I uh, moved out here and went to a uh, Bible college in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Yeah, so there's uh, there's some backstory there with the violent gospel and all that. And uh, I was just going to go to the Bible college and move back home once I was done. But I met my wife out here. She's uh, from Indiana. And so we're both transplants. And after we got married, this was just the easiest place for us to settle down. So how much time you spent money laundering, son? <laughs> I mean, that's part of the game when you're in ministry. Listen, um, I, I wanted to start off by saying I, I'm kind of sad to say that I have seen more than my fair share of preachers uh, parading around with rattlesnakes in one hand and a Bible in the other while speaking in tongues and or casting out demons as yeah. they ask for donations in the church. And here's the funny thing. They weren't necessarily hanging out in a former Dixie Mart store, but they were right there on cable TV. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> The uh, Bible college I went to is like really big in the Word of Faith movement. So uh -huh. you've got like the uh, the Copelands and Jesse Duplantis and uh, you know Creflo Dollar and that whole ring is very involved or has been involved with the Bible college that I went to. Well, our uh, we got one degree of separation from a lot of that world, and I probably since it's your show and not mine i won't go into great detail but boy if i could tell you some of the things i've seen and the one degree separation from some of the biggest preacher clowns in the world it would blow your mind it would melt your hair yep i mean i worked uh part-time for that ministry for about a year so i've seen a you know a lot of the behind the scenes type stuff so i'm sure we could uh trade stories for <sighs> yes we could trade yeah, and I don't want to be, you know, uh, this reminds me of a, a book that I've had about 10 years in the making. It's a nonfiction book that has to do with the spirituality and religion. And I, I don't know if I've shared this with my audience, but I said that I would write it once my mother passed away because it would offend her too badly because she was quite a faithful woman and she has passed away recently, sadly. But um, so it's time to write this book. And when I write that book, I'll have you back on and we'll share some of that uh, dirty, I mean, yeah. some of that laundry. Yeah, love to read it too. <laughs> now, this this is your this is your novella debut. Matter of fact, I was trying to find anything. This is your debut debut. Yeah, that's my uh, debut. That is humongoid. And yeah, uh, so I wrote this book. So Shotgun Honey was uh, open for submissions uh, in 2020, and uh, their deadline was March 28th. So, uh, and I really had no plans of submitting anything to them. And I was working on another Mac Doolin novel called Watch These Mountains Burn. And that book kind of reached a stalling point and I just like didn't know what to do with it. And I had written a short story where Mac's brother appears in it. Cause for the longest time, I've been writing about Mac for three or four years and, uh, he was great as a solo character, but then I'm like, there's just something missing with him. And then I wrote a short story where he had a brother and I'm like, that's the missing piece once Marshall appeared. And so I got the idea for a violent gospel and started writing it. And uh, I started writing it in February of 2020 and finished it around March 26th, like two days before the shotgun honey deadline. And, uh, Basically, I didn't do like any revisions on it or I just sent Shotgun Honey the first draft and like basically hoped and prayed for the best. And uh, they got it in March of 2020 and they, uh, Ron Phillips, the editor there, uh, 
offered me a book deal over Twitter in September of 2020. Yeah, so he made this long like Twitter uh, thread about his plans for Shotgun Honey in the upcoming year. And I've got a buddy who's also published with Shotgun Honey. I was at work at my day job and he texts me and he's like, have you been on Twitter today? And I was just like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm at work. And he's like, you should probably get on there. So right as I pull up my Twitter app on my phone, I get an email from Shotgun Honey, that, and it was from Ron. And he's like, hey, man, uh, don't know if the book is still available. I hope that it is. Uh, but I just offered you a book deal over Twitter. And I was just like, dude, I, I'm like, you're the only publisher I sent the book, book to. So it's all yours. <laughs> This is your own version of a Cinderella story. And the uh, fact yeah, totally. and the fact that he sent you the offer over Twitter, uh, I, th now that's different. I haven't, <laughs> you're bringing out my Southern accent. I can't, it's so funny. My North Carolina is coming out fierce. Uh, embrace it. Uh, yeah, embrace <laughs> it, brother. <laughs> daddy, daddy done got you good. Um. God, I don't think I've ever heard that before. But you know what? Uh, this is what I love about this, Mark, is that there are no more rules anymore. Right. And as, uh, and as Wanda Morris said on the show this past Monday, forget the rules. Write the book you want to write. And if it's exactly. good and resonates with people, they'll pick it up. Right. Uh, I forget who it was that said it, but uh, my approach is I heard this advice and I I've always embraced it. It's like, write the book that you want to read. Like yeah. you can like, study the market, see what's selling, see what it's appealing to general audiences. And you can write that. And I actually heard a story about a writer who like did all that stuff, found all like the things that the agents and the uh, marketing people were looking for. And he wrote, basically created like a bullet point and wrote that book. And then when it came time for his follow-up, he didn't know what to write. And he was like asking for advice and they're like, just be yourself. And they said that he put so much effort into appealing to the market. He forgot how to do that. Holy bones. That's hilarious. Yeah. And uh, another thing I've heard so many people say, I think the last person I heard say this is either Paula Meunier, the agent or Kent Kruger, the author said, if you write specifically to market, the minute that the market shifts, you're on the shore because you're left behind because the market has changed and now you've written specifically to that. So I'm with you. And I've always said, just like you want to cook what you want to cook because people are going to go, wow, look at this, because yep. you put all your passion and your attention and your focus and your practice into it. It's just logically going to be probably your best stuff. Right. And it goes back to that, you know, the old advice of write what you know. Right. And I am sitting on a fence on that, to tell you the truth, Mark. Uh, there is a write what you know, meaning, um, uh, let's say, for instance, I know a little bit about guns and I know a little bit about uh, action, but I'm not a Navy SEAL and I haven't served my country. So, right. but I have a great imagination. So I want to write that. But there are guys who really live in that world. So maybe they're better for it. However, if you got a great imagination, you write a great story. Yeah. And There's always going to be an element of make believe to it. That's why it's called fiction. Exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I'm not a, I'm not a gun guy either. So I'm always like hitting up all my writer buddies, like, tell me what I need to know about this or, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Let me back up a second because tell my audience who doesn't know who shotgun honey is and down and out books, who are they? What do they do? So uh, Shotgun Honey is an, uh, is an online magazine and publisher. They publish uh, flash, flash fiction, uh, 750 words or less. And so that's how I started my relationship with Shotgun Honey is by, uh, uh, by submitting uh, flash fiction to them. And they're not an easy magazine to get into. So like when, once I first started writing crime fiction, like my big goal uh, at the time was to just get a short story published with them. And I think at, they probably rejected like 8,000 pieces before I finally got a story. And I'm, I'm exaggerating, but they, they rejected basically everything I ever wrote. 
Okay, now wait a minute. But let, let, let me back up a second because this is yeah. your novella, so or this is your debut. So you have to have written something before somewhere that you, you didn't just come out of nowhere and this is your very first attempt. So tell me about this eight thousand, and, and you said it wasn't real, but what? So how many did you really uh, submit? So uh, as far as like short stories, I've had like nine or ten short stories published, okay. and with Shotgun Honey, I probably submitted I don't know. Uh, I probably submitted about 10 pieces with them and they've ended up publishing like two or three of my stories, my short stories. And, and uh, they, uh, as far as like, like novellas, like that's the only thing I ever submitted to them was uh, a violent gospel. And, uh, but I've got like probably seven novel length books that I've written that are just I trunked them because I just didn't think they were uh they were good enough to get published you know okay I, but all of them in one way or another all right but if you were to take your favorite of those seven we'll just we'll make this up you took favorite of your seven somebody at shotgun honey do you have enough a relationship that they would go well let me see what you got uh, even oh, though yeah. they're flash only right yeah uh Ron, the editor and owner of Shotgun Honey Books, me and him talk pretty regularly almost every day. And uh, if I had something like that, I wanted to shoot his way to just like, what do you think of this? He would he would look at it and he like would probably be interested in any of the uh, any of the novels that I've trashed just to see if there's something there that's pub publishable. But I really don't think any of it's like up to the standard of a violent gospel. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. All right, um, let's let's talk about uh, uh, this dirty preacher and his handful of dimwits. And uh, did you <laughs> did you know characters like this growing up, Mark? Uh, so I was raised Pentecostal. And, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> so yeah, I've uh, like the uh, very first Pentecostal church I ever went to was probably. Uh, it was in South Carolina, and uh, it was basically like Southern Baptist with speaking in tongues. It wasn't like super charismatic or like you'd always have like the old timers there with, that would talk about the old Holy Ghost services where people would dance in the aisles and run on the pews and, you know, have like, you know, pray for people's healing and all that stuff. But uh, yeah. you never saw any of I never saw any of it while I was going there. And then we moved on from that church and started going to a mega church in Greenville, South Carolina. That was like, like on the opposite end of the extreme where they were really charismatic. They had like a, a rock and roll band leading worship and uh, it, it got pretty wild sometimes. And uh, I had a, a, a minister friend there that got me turned on to the Bible college that I ended up going to. And the Bible college that I went to is Pentecostal and, uh, it got, it got, they get pretty wild there. So yeah, I've, uh, and you get all kinds of like when you're in that and, uh, get, you're around all kinds of different types of characters anyway. Right. And so like Randy Jessup, the, uh, the minister, the preacher in a violent gospel is kind of like, uh, a combination of like, the minister from that mega church I went to in South Carolina, and then just uh, some different personality traits of like some of my classmates from Bible college. All right. Well, you're reading my very next question because I said your pastor Harper Llewellyn is quite the character in a lot of the, like some of the preachers I know. So you, yeah. who did you base him on? So you just answered. That's perfect. I do right. like the fact this is so funny. <clears throat> this is what got my attention. Uh, by the way, when I was hanging out in Pentecostal circles for a very short time, we called them chandelier swingers. <laughs> yeah, get that every now and then. <laughs> yeah, but what what caught my attention was the fact that he he has got quite the uh, healthy command of the Holy Scriptures. Right. Yeah, and that's uh like that was a like when I first wrote like the first draft of the Bible gospel, he didn't really throw around scriptures like that. Mm -hmm. It was just like these like semi religious, like quotes and sayings and stuff like that. And I started thinking about uh, when I was in Bible college, 
and everybody had their scriptures and like you'd get into debates and stuff like that and they would just like we we basically did our best to memorize the book and i'm like if he's a minister he would use scripture against people and basically use it like a weapon and so i wanted that to be like an aspect of his character like where he manipulates and you know gets people to do his bidding because he's in command of scripture like that yeah so here's I want to, if, if you're, if it's not too personal, I do want to drill down how much of that world, uh, do you still, let's just use the word embrace. I'm just curious. Uh, that's a good question. I got to think about that. Like, Take your still, time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, like I still consider myself to be a Christian. My wife and I still attend church and whatnot, but, uh, like there's like from the more charismatic extreme of it, there's like a lot of it that I don't embrace as much now because looking back on it, I can, it's man, that's like, I know what I want to say, but it's kind of hard to say it like I want to without one sounding, I don't want to sound disrespectful for the, you know, friends and stuff that are still involved in that world. Um, Dude, you got me with that one. Um, oh, I love yeah. getting people because it <laughs> happens so rarely. Okay, so a lot of the more like manipulative aspects of it, mm -hmm. you know, like, like for example, like money. Like it was always like, whatever you give, you receive back, mm -hmm. and it's and that's just a way to like if you get people to believe that if you give like, you know you're so much to God. He's going to give you back that with interest or whatever. That was, that's what he liked. They, they like to say. And, well. uh, and just knowing like some of the struggles people had, like, you know, not being able to pay their mortgage or like provide for their kids, but they're given to the church because they believe that, you know, it's going to come back to them in an increase and they're going to get wealthy by giving to the church. That's just not true. Uh, they're somebody's going to get wealthy. It isn't going to be them. Yeah. Right. And it never was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Do I want to open up a can of whoop ass, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this, this got deep. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes the show, you know, that's a good thing about hanging out with me is that, you know, I yeah. can sit here and talk about your book all day long, but everybody else on the planet's going to do the exact same thing. I like to get inside your head and inside your world, but, uh, and again, I, I'm with you, Mark, no disrespect to any, I, I believe this one thing, everybody should believe what they want to believe, right? You should have the freedom to yep. go to whatever church, believe whatever you want. And if I don't believe your way, Mark, you should look at me and go, okay, cool. Be on your way. Just agree to disagree. But exactly. But the people who, and there are many people out there, and I'll say this very succinctly, believe that their way is the single only way and every other way is complete blasphemy. I, I got a little problem with that. Yeah, same here. All right. Well, the book is fun. I, you know, it's a novella, so you can rip through it pretty much in one sitting. Let me see here. I'm going right. to, it is, uh, 150 it, pages. 130 pages and uh, you're going to get a little you're going to get a little gospel in here you're going to get some violence but you're going to get some good god's word in it actually it is a, a great little testimony if you will borrow the phrase that you do have scriptures in it so there should be i like how peter ferris uh one of the blurb on the back he said it's an old testament ass whooping that is one of my favorite and one rollicking old testament ass whooping of a debut you know, you've got, that's the thing about you, brother. Let me check inside. Uh, this is what got my attention. And I, I want this gentleman on my show so bad because uh, he is such a terrific writer and he's such a, everything I've heard about him is wonderful. Is this essay, uh, Sean Cosby? Oh, he's the best. Me and I, him are uh, Twitter buddies and I want to hang out with him in person like so bad and uh, was hoping that was going to ha happen at uh, BoucherCon this year in New Orleans, but, you know, that ended up getting canceled. But uh, 
So when it comes to blurbs, I've got no shame. And I totally believe in riding coattails, you know, if they're uh, provided. So I just, uh, I made like a wish list of everyone I wanted to blurb the book and pretty much went uh, almost batted a thousand on that. There, I only had like one author who didn't reply to me, but I wanted like Sean and I wanted Brian Panwich and Peter Ferris because uh, like, so before I got into writing Southern crime fiction, I was like, I, I wrote fantasy, like w the Wheel of Time, Lord of the Rings style uh, fantasy. And it took me about five years to realize I sucked at that. And uh, I got into Southern fiction because of Peter Ferris. And he's got a, a book called Last Call for the Living that wow. just like, he's writing about North Georgia and some, he's got some similar elements in that book that are in a violent gospel. And then I discovered Brian Panowich, his Bull Mountain series which is also set in North Georgia. And I'm like, these guys are writing about people I grew up with. And so I'm like, I can do this. And I was like living in, you know, living out here in Oklahoma, getting homesick. And I'm like, maybe that's like a cure for homesickness is writing about home. And so that's what got me on the path of uh, writing Southern crime fiction. And those, those two guys were like two of the first people I emailed and asked for blurbs for the book. All right. So two real quick things I want to say. First of all is uh, I, my dream one day is to be able to take my podcast on the road. And I would love nothing more in the world than to roll out to Georgia and have you and Sean and a whole gaggle of guys show up and we just sit around a campfire or a table or my RV or whatever and just just talk about writing because th I really so desperately miss that face to face. Yeah, that's awesome. Number two. So you're telling me, and I want you to do this for the, for the writers who listen to the show. You're telling me you just reached out to these guys and said, hey, you sent the book and said, would you read this and would you write a blur? How did you do it? So I found, uh, like went to their personal websites, see if they had a way to contact them or if they had like a email address where I could reach out to them. And uh, once I found that, I basically said, hey, this is, you know, explained who I was, that I was a fan of theirs, um, talked about how their like work uh, touched me and influenced me and said, this is my book. It's coming out on such and such date. Um, here's a little synopsis of it. Basically, I told everybody it was uh, the Dukes of Hazard meets Justified, something like that, you know, and uh, told them that I would really love it if they would blurb the book, that I felt like it would, it would add some authenticity to the book, you know, and, you know, I so reached out to them that way. And uh, like I said, like five of the six writers I reached out to all said yes. Well, I'll be honest, between some of your friends at uh, Down and Out and reading, uh, catching some of these blurbs somewhere along the way, that's a, that's the reason you're sitting there across from me. And, and, right. and kudos to you, brother. I appreciate it. But I mean, come on, man. Uh, yeah. Call, talking about razor blade tears and blacktop wasteland and then Panowich and yeah well well done sir well done yeah, it's a again fun quick read if you like southern you know what you have done to me today boy <laughs> you have gotten me I have uh you're making me think this is another thing I love hanging out with writers god dang it is I think of a I've got my own little slush pile my stories that I've started or you know gotten halfway through or whatever and I think, oh, nobody's going to like this piece of shit. And sitting here talking to you, I go, you know what? There's this story. I want to take it and work on it and send it down to Shotgun Honey or what and, and see what they like. I live by this philosophy, Mark. I, I've got about a half a dozen. But all anybody can do is say no. Yeah. And guess what? Big whoop. So you say no, somebody's going to say yes eventually. And I think that's the kind of tenacity that you have to be in this business because it's crazy business. Yeah, I mean, that's how I felt about the blurbs. I'm like, I'm going to, because I've seen a lot on the independent publishing scene. Most people, when they get blurbs, they get their friends to blurb it. You know, authors they're, that they're buddies with who are about on the same level of success that they have. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's cool and all. But at some point, that just turns into a cir circle jerk. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> well put, well put. Yeah. And, uh, me, I'm wanting to get like, I'm wanting to make a career out of this. Yeah. And you can't do that just by having your buddies praise your book. You got to, you got to 
get it in the hands of people who are on a level of success that you haven't gotten to yet. Yeah. So I'm I, like, like I said, I'm not afraid of riding somebody's coattails. Well, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I'm think. Let me think of about uh, three guys right now that I would just about cut off my pinky uh, if I could get them to blurb one of my books. And in no uncertain order, I think about like Don Winslow. Who I've read pretty much everything he's ever written, and it, it doesn't get any better than Don Winslow. And if he wrote a blurb for me, I, I'd almost say, "Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Lord. Take me now. Come on." Uh, you know, another one would be Lee Child because I I'm a, I'm such a fan of his. Um, I think about Jack Carr, who's just he's yeah. the guy I was thinking about earlier when I said he he lived it. He's a sniper. He knows guns. He's a tech head. He's a man's toy fanatic. But uh, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage my listeners to do exactly what you do and what we both in our hearts want to do, and that is just reach out and ask. And if they say no, move on. Right? They ain't gonna hurt you. Exactly. We're going to take a very short break here on the Thriller Zone, and we come back. We're going to do our rapid-fire questions with Mark Westmoreland, and this is going to be very off the pass than it generally does. I'm usually more serious, but today I knew I was going to have some fun with Mark, and we're going to see what he's made of right after this. Don't go anywhere. Hi, Dave. It's Dave Darling. I just wanted to drop you a note to say, really enjoying your interviews and your show. Love the guests, and... I'm learning a lot as well. I'm also looking forward to being on your show in the new year. I can't wait. Hope things are going good, and I'll talk to you later. Bye for now. Thanks for those mighty kind words, David. And if you'd like to share your compliments, gripes, or suggestions, just go to thethrillerzone.com, click on the red Send a Voicemail button on the right side of the screen, and speak your mind. All input is welcome, and if chosen, will be shared with our audience. Thanks again, David. Hey, y'all. If you're sitting in your Trans Am listening to this podcast right now, it's the Thriller Zone with David Temple, and I'm Mark Westmoreland, author of A Violent Gospel. And now, back to the show. You were talking about your uh, wish list of uh, people you want to blurb your book. That's Mm -hmm. me with Ace Atkins. Like, he's a huge uh, Burt Reynolds fan. And uh, so, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but whenever, at whatever point, Midnight Runner gets uh published i'm getting aces blurb even if i have to drive to oxford and stalk the guy well guess what just a little inside scoop i haven't even announced this yet i don't think ace is going to be on the show the oh, first shit, we- that's first week of january he's kicking off new year's my new year's show in season two of the thriller zone he's going to be nice. the first guest that's awesome yeah I'm not, don't hold me to this because I got a lot of miles to cover between now and then, but, uh, I might have to have you call in. I might cry if that happens. (laughs) Well, I'll put my arms around you. (laughs) Hey, I do have to say like, uh, since you started the podcast, one thing I've really enjoyed is how it's grown and your caliber of guests just keeps getting better and better and better. You know, it's really cool to see the podcast grow the way it has. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 you know, that means a lot to me, Mark. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You're you're kicking ass. Well, a couple things, you know, we only started this in June. I know it's crazy. And, uh, and, and I'm saying this with all due respect, I am an equal opportunity uh, chatter. I, right. I've been doing this a long time. I love people. I love artists. I love people who create. I don't care if you're a New York Times bestseller or your brand new debut novella author. We're all in it together. We're all banging it out, banging the keyboard, trying to make our dreams come true. So um, um, one thing I appreciated, like I don't struggle with one of my flaws probably is that I don't really struggle with imposter syndrome. Like I never get like insecure. Well, you know, there's times I get insecure about like aspects of story and stuff like that, but I've always like had the opinion, like, yo, I belong here. But when I saw some of the guests you've had on like PJ Vernon and William Boyle, and I'm like, I did have a moment where I was like, suffered a little bit of imposter syndrome. Like, man, I'm going to be on that podcast. And he's got people like that on there. So it's really cool. 
Well, I'm very humbled by those kind comments, and I mean that with all sincerity. Uh, it's just uh, another n- another one of my tenacity things. I just ask. All you can do is say yeah. no. Right. Um, but I, I will admit, yeah, a- the fact that Ace is kicking off 2022 with me, and there's, I got, I got, we already now booked through, I'm booked up until f- first or second week of February. Nice. And um, I could not be happier. Um, it has slowed down my writing, which has been a little bit of a challenge. And I, and I, I'm so, if I can just share this moment with you, I'm so torn because I love to write. I've always loved to write. I have never pursued it uh, as much as I have of recent because I didn't think I had the goods, but here's the thing. And I mean this in all the best ways I have no less than 60 books sitting around me right now that I've either read or have yet to read for this show alone. So I'm reading at least two books a week and to be able to read it and digest it and make notes and then have the show and then cut the show and the video and then for audio, it's, you know, it's a full-time job. So I'm trying to figure out how to, full-time job. I'm trying to figure out how to squeeze that writing in. So I just, without working from 5 a.m. to, you know, 9 p.m. Right. Anyway, it is time as we begin to wrap the show. Mark Westmoreland is our guest. It is a violent gospel, and it's time for rapid fire questions. I'm going to warn you. The first one's a little bit bizarre, but I knew when I met you through emails and text and following you on Twitter that you'd be up for it. I'm not worried about it. You wake up in a room, Mark, there's no doors, but there are three barred cells in front of you. In the first cell, there's a hungry mountain lion. Okay. In the second one, there's a pile of enormous snakes. And in the third, there's an angry ex-girlfriend carrying a shotgun who's got evil on her mind. (laughs) Now, in 30 seconds, someone's going to say over the speaker, one door is going to open, but you get to choose which one. If you don't choose, all three will open and there's going to be quite an ass whooping. Which (laughs) one of those three doors would you choose and why? Okay, with the mountain lion, is it a cub or is it full grown? It's full grown and it's hungry. Okay, then I'm taking the angry ex-girlfriend because I feel like I can charm her out of the shotgun. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, Very well done. All right. Now, number two. I'm sad to say, Mark, you've died and gone to heaven. Okay. But when you reach the pearly gates, St. Buford says you can't get in just yet. No, you got to go back as Pastor Burt Reynolds and preach the good gospel. What kind of church would it be, and who's going to be your sidekick? Oh, man. Well, if I'm <laughs> Pastor Burt Reynolds, obviously, Snowman is going to be my sidekick. <laughs> and you said, what kind of church is it going to be? Well, it's going to be the, uh, the uh, Bandit Worship Center, and we're just going to watch Smokey and the Bandit every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. <laughs> And all donations will go to good causes that have nothing to do with your church, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Number three is actually more serious. Uh, When you're not watching the Georgia Dogs play football, what are you reading in your spare time and what music is playing in the background? So I'm a huge Allman Brothers fan. So Mm. I've I've got a live at Fillmore East on. Uh, My wife and I actually just uh, flew home to Georgia and, uh, hung out in Athens for the weekend to go see one of our favorite bands called uh, the Dirty Govnas, G-U-V apostrophe N-A-H-S. And they are, uh, they're from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. They, imagine if the Rolling Stones uh, recorded Southern Rock with a little bit of Myth to Soul mixed in. Oh boy. As far as what I'm reading. So yesterday I just finished reading Tomato Red by Daniel Woodrell. And today I started uh, Pride of Eden by Taylor Brown. It's got some elements of Tiger King in there. He's one of those writers that he's so good at what he does. It'll piss you off a little bit because it'll have you want to do that too, but you know you don't have the talent to pull it off. 
Kind of like some of Cormac McCarthy stuff. Exactly. Like everybody wants to imitate Cormac McCarthy's style, but you can't do that because you're not Cormac McCarthy. And so that's like Taylor is always like, like, like he's got a new book coming out called Wing Walkers. And William Faulkner is one of the characters in the book. And I'm like, I would love to write a book with William Faulkner in it because sure. I love William Faulkner, but I'm not a good enough writer to do that. Basically, I'm going to write stuff where I like rip off the Dukes of Hazard or rip off Smokey and the Bandits, something like that, you know? I guess my best piece of advice is just stay in your own lane, you know? Exactly. Find out, <clears throat> find out what your signature, what your, what that thing is makes you Mark Westmoreland, uh, you know, right. find that thing that just is completely unique to you. And look, we all know that you can borrow things from other writers. You can borrow nuance. You can borrow, uh, pacing and things like that. You can borrow tiny little things. You just don't want to copy people, but we're all right. borrowing from anybody who says they don't borrow something from somebody. It's just lying to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's Me, no. I'm in my element when I'm writing about trailer parks. You what? I'm in my element when I'm writing about trailer parks. I think that's <laughs> one of the, the reasons I loved uh, and still love because it's another season coming of Ozark. Yes. Because the first of all, Jason Bateman's one of my favorite actors of all time, and he's a great yeah. director. But the characters in that trailer park, I mean, I grew up with people like that and they nailed it. It isn't, it isn't a, uh, a, a caricature, a caricature of these, some of those folks, it is them and, and it's, it's real. So yeah, stay in your own lane, be your own thing. And, um, Mark, I got to tell you something, dude, this, this book is, uh, it's fun. It's gritty. It's, you know, it's, nobody's going to get hurt. It's not going to take you, it's not, you know, War and peace, and you can enjoy it. And I, I wish you humongous success, brother. Appreciate that. And uh, if anybody wants to learn more about you, you can go to Twitter. It's Mark, y'all. <laughs> yep, you'll find me hanging out there talking uh, talking dogs and Atlanta Braves during baseball season. And every now and then I'll uh, throw out some Burt Reynolds. Yeah. I went looking for a website, but you don't have one, do you? No, that's one, I, that's one thing I need to do is uh, get a website developed. I'm just lazy when it comes to that stuff. Dude, uh, we can get off microphone and I can give you a couple of real twi uh, tips. I spent about 20 years building websites and uh, I got a pretty good idea how those work. And you can do it for not terribly expensive and get yourself awesome. up and running. I appreciate that. But seriously, once again, folks, it's Mark Yall at Twitter, and he'll have a website very soon. But you follow him there, and you'll get everything you need. And once again, Mark, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. Thanks again for hanging out, Mark. You're going to do great. Before I announce next week's guest, I just want to remind you to please leave a review either on our Thriller Zone website, it's super easy to do, or on Apple Podcasts, where they love our five-star reviews. It helps more than you know and certainly helps keep this show rolling on all 10 cylinders. Okay, on next week's show, I'm thrilled to welcome, for a return visit, I might add, the one and only New York Times bestselling author and friend of the show, Ted Bell. If you will recall, Ted was on the show back in August on episode number eight, where he promised to return to chat about his new book in the Alex Hawk thriller series, Seahawk, which drops on December 7th. Can you believe it's nearly the end of the year? <laughs> anyway, Ted is a hoot. The book is great, and we promise to have a good time. So whatever you do, don't miss Ted Bell and me next Friday right here on The Thriller Zone. <laughs>